So thank you very much for joining us today for uh, our Dryad Open House Delivering on Your Data Sharing Policy. Um, we are joined by Dryad's Head of Publishing Services, Jess Herzog, and uh, uh, Jagareth Jenkins, who is a Senior Commissioning Editor at Wiley. Um, we are, uh, uh, Jess and Gareth will, will give you an overview of, of how Dryad helps journals deliver on their open data sharing policies, and then we'll have time for discussion and Q&A at the end. Um, I wanted to note that this event, like all Dryad events, is covered by our code of conduct. The link is in the chat. Um, and feel free, since we're a very small group, I, I doubt you'll you'll need this uh, function, but you, you can use the Q&A function uh, to uh, submit questions to us if you want, or the chat. Um, and as I said, we'll have ample time for a discussion at the end. I'll turn things over to Jess. Thanks, Sarah. So I am going to um, share my screen. Can you all see my first slide? Yes, I'm gonna hide my um, floating meeting controls so they're out of sight. Um, welcome, thank you for being here. And um, thank you, Sarah, for um, helping to manage this presentation today. So um, we are going to, I have uh, plenty of slides to get through, but I promise you we'll get to the good stuff um, I'm pleased to have Gareth here to talk about his experience and the journal's experience in partnering with Dryad. So for, for those of you here, I'm sure you know who we are. And today I'm going to talk about um, how we can help and how we make it easier to share, find, use, and cite the data that's published on Dryad. And um, we're in a good place to help you meet your data sharing requirements. So here are a few great reasons to choose Dryad. Um, researchers, institutions, and publishers um, partner with us because of our um, curation process, um, which is a great service and adds a lot of um, quality and value, our open publication, and the fact that we prepare our data sets um, and make them optimized for reuse. Submissions. To Dryad can be received from any field in any open file format. Of course, if there is a discipline-specific repository, we also would suggest um, researchers go there first. But as a generalist repository, one of many available, um, I hope to convince you today why Dryad's the place to be. Um, we offer straightforward compliance and we work directly and partner with um, publishers and institutions to streamline the process and um, gel or blend with the journal editorial and publication processes. And we're a community led organization. We are committed to our research community and Quality control, so I touched on this briefly, but um, I wanna talk a bit, and I will talk a bit about our curation process, um, our careful review with metadata, and the support and guidance we provide to our authors. We believe in this statement, and so in the following slides, I'm going to um, run through some of these very important features of Dryad. Um, we work to make data accessible, discoverable, reusable, protected, and preserved for perpetuity, and well-connected. So this is, this is my agenda for today. I'm going to run through some slides to demonstrate how we um, check all of these boxes. So for some of you on the call today, um, you know, if you have a policy, a data policy that requires or encourages authors to share their research data, Dryad's designed to support it. Here's a snapshot of our curation process. Um, I just put, this is the late addition to the slide deck because we don't have this um, anywhere on our website. So that's soon to come in our help pages, but I wanted to show you the bite-sized, most simplistic version of the curation and publication processes. 
In the top left, you see the data set is submitted. There is an option to place the data set in private for peer review, which is great um, and meets the needs for a journal's peer review process. And I will show you in a future slide what it looks like when submissions are auto-released upon acceptance of a manuscript, um, requiring no effort from the author's end, the journal end, or the, curate, the curation side. Or it's also an option that the data set goes right into our curation process where the metadata and data files are carefully evaluated. And most of the time revisions are required. Um, and that's why the curation team is here and available to help guide authors. Um, one of our most common sendbacks is for a readme file. Others include an updated title to improve discoverability. So um, it happens, it sometimes happens that data sets are in great shape and um, check all those boxes I previously talked about. Um, and can be published right away. But usually there are some minor revisions required. And when that data set is returned, it goes through a brief curation process again, and then it's published. And of course, we have an option for versioning. So data sets can be updated post publication. And what's not shown here is all the files that are uploaded to Zenodo um, for publication there, which could include software or supplemental files. They are also made publicly available once that um, Dryad data set's published. So that's the process in a nutshell. Um, our curators. So I'm, not, I'm trying to reduce my view here. So we have two full-time curators, soon three, and one part-time curator, and then um, two located and based in India. And they ensure that the data files are well organized, formatted properly, and appropriate for sharing. So they ensure that all the data files comply with the CC0 license waiver that we require. And if not, there's a great option to upload any files uh, that fall under a different license to Zenodo. The curators work to verify that all files can be opened accessible and they carefully review that readme file. That's probably the most important um, piece for us because that's the key to the data. That's the key to, to understanding what's presented and um, they ensure that is um, comprehensive and um, clear. Um, they also provide personal support and guidance to authors. So it's not responding to authors with a request to update your readme file to make it better. It's providing specific guidance so authors know exactly the steps they need to take in order to get their data set published. And the curator who picks up these data sets from the queue is responsible for it until publication. Um, and in the background, of course, that curator, we, we work as a team, so we're frequently in contact with each other and um, working together on data sets frequently, providing each other with support. They also, uh, you know, at the start of the curation process, they work to connect data to um, trusted identifiers to promote discoverability. We'll look at that, um, the ROAR database and um, FunRef, and um, also authors who submit have the option to include their ORCID as well. And they evaluate beyond a checklist. So I, I put this in here because I wanted to mention that the, the real value our curators add is that they're not just looking at all the pieces that need to be checked or included when they are reviewing data set. They take a, a full view. I like to call it a helicopter view of the submission and, and understand what's being presented and um, in some recent cases, we've had some um, questionable data sets submitted. So they're kind of the gatekeepers to um, who determine whether something might be inappropriate or require um, a careful eye or, or additional inspection. So um, that's part of the value they add. Now I wanted to talk about accessibility. We talked about the CC0 waiver. Um, oftentimes where we catch 
um, problems is in the README file if a different license is mentioned. And um, all data is accessible through our website and our open API. And as I mentioned, should be able to be opened without barriers. So curators don't have any special um, programs that we pay for in order to access the software. So we ensure that um, anyone can open it regardless of their um, discipline. And then um, I will show you our private for peer review option, which helps support double blind review. Now, um, here is a snapshot of um, the unique private URL that's provided to all data sets upon submission. And if your journal adopts a double blind review process, I wanna show you what it looks like when this link is selected. Um, and this link should not be published, should not be published by the way, the DOI should be published. Um, so this is what it looks like when that link is selected, the user, so a peer reviewer, it will be directed to this page and then the automatic of all data files uploaded will begin. So if in this screenshot, you can see that there are files on Dryad as well as Zenodo. And so that files be, those files begin to download, but the metadata is all private. And so this really helps facilitate a double bind review process. I will say that um, the readme file can be identifying if the author, authors included their names in there. And then um, the software files, if the author includes their last names, or um, that could also be identifying. And I've had a few conversations recently and um, some ideas to help guide authors to prevent any, any errors in this realm, uh, which include updating our, our guidelines. Um, discoverability, uh, we have a search function, explore data on the top right of our page, and you can search by journal, keywords, file type, um, um, research um, of funders. And uh, recently we required uh, keywords. That was an optional field, field before. So we have um, a minimum of three keywords that are required upon submission now. And all data sets are indexed by Thomson Reuters Data Citation Index, Scopus, and Google Data Set Search. And many data sets that, as I'll show you, are related to publications or other data. And um, so authors have the option to link as many um, research outputs or objects that they like um, to their data set. As far as reuse, um, as I mentioned, the README file is essential. And so we have developed our own template. Previously, we were directing authors to the Cornell template, which was great. Um, we found that there was some redundant data um, duplicate information we were requesting. So we um, revised and created our own, a stripped down version, just requesting the basics and anything that's not already available in the um, metadata. And so um, this is optional. Of course, we still have authors that submit readme files in um, text format, um, markdown, what have you, and those are perfectly acceptable, but this is available to authors if they need um, a guide. And um, we also have a tabular data checker embedded in our submission process, and that's an integration with the frictionless framework. I don't know if you, you probably have not seen this work before. So I do have, um, and the next slide, I'm gonna show you what it looks like when this tabular data check is put into use. But you can see here, um, these files have passed that check. And in this, um, short video, what you're seeing here is a file being uploaded and then a report being generated listing um, potential issues, not errors, but just potential issues that the author may want to review before submitting this for curation. So this is performing a check, you know, if there are blank columns or um, rows of data, it's just highlighting them for the author to take another peek at. Of course, they can proceed to submit without making any changes at this time. 
but um, this feature is just extra helpful in getting uh, receiving the data in a format that's um, easily um, understandable and ready for reuse. And this is a, also a tool that we continue to look at and make enhancements to to improve it. Um, the specifics about what file types this checks for is on our help site. So it checks, um, uh, let's see, Excel files, just tabular data files, and also up to a certain um, size. The data we publish is also um, very protected by our core trust seal, and it's, as we mentioned, per perpetually available and files are replicated with multiple copies and backed up on a nightly basis. Now I mentioned connectivity um, and this is a fine slide, but I, I prefer to show you um, what it looks like on a published data set in my neck on the next page. But what's not there is um, I think what it's it's not gonna show you fund ref and how um, those funders are listed. listed. But as I mentioned, the curators work to match um, ROAR IDs. Um, so this could be, if there are 20 authors on a data set and we're working to match affiliations, it can take some time. And um, we also work to match funders, whatever the author puts in, we, we work to match that. And the author, the submitting author is required to submit with the ORCID, which is great. And um, if an email is provided for the co-authors, they're also invited to attach the ORCID IDs to the data set. So let's take a look, because this is just a better view of how connected a published data set is. At the top, you see um, ORCID ID, and you see some listed for the additional authors, um, a ROAR ID, which is clearly matched. Um, if it wasn't, an asterisk would appear. Um, next to the University of California, Berkeley. And next you see the related work. So this is where authors can link to the primary article, um, any um, files on Zenodo or additional software files or um, data management plans. Um, just about anything can be provided here, links to preprints. And so um, um, this is a great way also just to link to the, um, you know, to get more citations for that, um, the related journal article. And then um, down on the left here, you'll see um, every submission is assigned to DOI at submission, and that does not change upon publication. And then we have metrics on the right-hand side um, that follow the make data count best practices. So you'll have views, downloads, and citations reported and tracked for every published data set. And then finally, the full citation is available at the bottom there. Um, this code, which you'll have access to when you reference this presentation, um, takes you to more information about the um, API integration. So this looks beautiful. <laughs> That's a better view. So let's. I just wanna briefly talk about the benefits of integration. Um, for publishers, it's easy. It's This is a, a simple to enable a connection and configure for your workflow. There, We work to ensure high quality metadata with minimal management or, or effort. And of course, we talked about the private shareable links for um, peer review and double blind review. And an automatic, automatic process to initiate curation from PPR. And of course, you see below, um, the benefits for authors and future users. And I wanna show you um, what that seamless integration looks like for publishers. Um, so for authors and future users, we've covered that previously. Um, so when an uh, author is submitting to Dryad, they plug in that journal name and a ma related manuscript number. And because we are receiving information from that journal, the author can simply click the option to import manuscript metadata and whatever the journal provides to us, whether it's um, author line, keywords, title, that will all automatically fill in the first page of the submission form, saving author time and reducing potential errors that may need to be fixed by our curation team. 
And then um, data sets will automatically release from private for peer review. So if you have a journal that's automatically set up um, to recognize submissions from that journal title, like ecology and evolution, every, every author that submits you know, they can, um, their submission can automatically be placed in private for peer review. And you see here, um, this is the guts of it. So this is what the curators see, the activity log. Um, a notice of acceptance was received from the journal and the submission is immediately put in the queue for curation and rapid publication, of course, pending any revisions. But that's, that's what it looks like on our end and that's how quickly and seamlessly it can work with an integration. That's my bit. <laughs> um, I invite, I'm really pleased to have Gareth Jenkins, um, an editor in chief at Ecology and Evolution, join us to talk a bit about his experience in partnering with Dryad. Okay, thanks, Jess. Um, yeah, so as Jess says, I'm um, an editor in chief at Ecology and Evolution. So I'm a full time editor based at Wiley. Um, we have six editors in chief on the journal, actually, it's, it's pretty large. And we've got a sort of a, a good history going back with Dryad. Um, our founding editor in chief, Alan Moore, was also involved in the founding of Dryad. Another one, Andrew Beckerman, is currently on the board of Dryad. So there's a there's a good relationship between the journal and Dryad. So if we just go on to the first slide. Cheers. So I'm while I'm mostly work on ecology and evolution, I'm also involved with the open data strategy for our entire ecology and evolutionary portfolio. No Wiley. And we are very much trying to move towards open data. I feel that the ecology field especially is ahead of the game here, where our, our community is very much into, into open data. And we, we tend not to mandate any specific repository, but I'd say a significant majority of our author data sets are overseen by Dryad. And certainly if any author asks me for recommendation, I will recommend Dryad because we've always had a positive experience. And because of that, it's important that we maintain dialogue, which which Dryad has always been happy to do. Um, I have regular meetings with Jess, for example, um, but that it, it's a historic relationship and it certainly feels like a partnership. So no complaints there. And I'd say the three, three key criteria for us when we look for uh, data repositories, are we want to ensure for our authors, ease of uploads, quality of curation, active curation, and I think most crucially, ability to handle scale. Um, the number of articles published goes up every year. As we move towards open data, we want to ensure our authors are served. And for all three of these, Dryad delivers basically for the criteria that Jess has already out uploaded. And it's, it's it's not just about having the 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 technology there and the and the creation there. It's we want to be able to talk about new features. It's uh, publishing is, is constantly changing, constantly evolving. Um, as a result, there'll need to be new features, new software, new tools. So it's great that we're constantly involved in new tools. I mean, Jess spoke about frictionless um, a few slides back. I think that's a fantastic addition that tried to involve and we've been kept informed about that. So it's really beneficial that we can do that. And it's, because of this conversation, then there's, there's always openness between us. We can give clear advice and guidance to our authors. Um, I'm sure anyone listening to this doesn't need to be told that advice on archiving your data can be vague sometimes. Um, we want to move towards giving very specific guidance. Um, I'll talk about that a bit later in a, an article we recently had published, um, but it's something we're, we're very keen to improve. And there's also um, the private for peer review option. Jess has already spoken about. I think this is an example of a great example of, of how Drive provides something that we need for our publishing portfolio. There's a variety of different modes of peer review, you know, single blind, double blind, open peer review. Each one has got its critics and its advocates. Everyone's got different opinions, but we need to be able, able to offer those at different journals. And if we are going to offer something like double blind, you need a tool that makes that simple for the author and it needs to be scalable. I know I'm mentioning scale again, but that's very important to us. And uh, private peer review, 
I think is probably the best option for our authors and this, and we, we very much encourage them to use it. Um, if, on the next slide, I've got an example, another example of how we've worked together. This was um, a sort of a nice little virtual issue that we put together end of last year, sort of start of this year. And it was, uh, it brought together the most downloaded and viewed data sets associated with published articles in either widely owned journals or partners that we, uh, society partners that we publish with. Um, the three key ones for us being the British Ecological Society, Ecological Society of America, and Nordic Society Oikos. So in this virtual issue, which we linked to across several of our journals, it just, it was, it was a good way of just showing this relationship I've been talking about um, and highlighting how important open data, open data is in general. Um, so yeah, that's the, the links there. It's a nice one to uh, to read through. The, you know, you've got as well as the society journals there. You've got you've got um, some of our biogeography journals, a couple of evolutionary journals, ecology letters, and of course ecology and evolution. So yeah, anyone that's listening, that's available to everyone to look at. We'll pop that link into the chat as well. Oh, great. Yes, the se the second part I'd like to talk about is how Dryad can help. Widely in, in specifically, but publishing in general, align with new disciplinary norms. And again, this is specific to ecology and evolutionary biology, but I think the general principles could apply across fields. So on the next slide, you'll see here an article we put out last month. And in this, we looked at existing author guidance for open data, so data, code, metadata. And we summarize that because, like I mentioned earlier, the guidance you find can be lacking. It's piecemeal. It can miss certain details. It can be vague and it can be frustrating for authors, to be honest. So a group of us um, worked together on this and we, we looked to get put some clear guidelines with a very strong focus on reproducibility. And this is what came out of it. Some minimum standards that we're hoping to get adopted across the board to help authors put together decent data sets. And Dryad had been involved from the start with this. Um, it kicked off about 18 months ago. We spoke with uh, Daniela Lohenberg initially, who's no longer with Dryad, and then Jess has been collaborating on this as well. And uh, yeah, on the next slide, I'll talk a bit more about this. So it basically shows how useful it is to partner, not just with Dryad as a repository, but with journal editors and the societies those editors work with. We got together again our, our key ecology and evolution ecology um, societies, lots of conversation between editors, Wiley staff, Dryad staff. And it was a, it was a really interesting um, project to be involved with really because there's a lot of opinions on this, um, a lot of back and forth, took a while. But it's had a really good reaction on social media since it's it's been launched. Um, a number of journals have incorporated into their data policies more almost every week and having conversations across our journals to get this incorporated. And I think crucially, feedback from Dryad throughout the process helped shape it. And Dryad were more than willing to offer readme templates, for example, give pointers, always asking how they can help with their, their, their software or edits to help best serve this. And I know that's a, an active project going forward. So that's just a couple of examples there for me about how Wiley has been working with Dryad for over a decade now. I think probably the, the most indicative example of, uh, of how well it's going is that I've been a full-time um, editor on Ecology and Evolution for over five years now, and not once have I had a complaint one of our authors about a data set and I'm across hundreds of papers every year so I think that's pretty telling and that's me thanks Gareth 